Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Marge Frederick, and a lot of my brothers and sisters call me Margie, and so, um, uh, but Joel calls me Marge, and, uh, and my full name is actually Marjorie. Um, I have a joke. I don't usually tell jokes, but I thought I should do a joke for in honor of Dave. Um, so, uh, since I am a scientist and a mathematician, uh, this joke relates to kind of to that. So, did you hear about the first restaurant to open on the moon? It had great food, but no atmosphere. Oh, well. Um, today, uh, I'm going to be talking on Mark, and uh, the Pharisees are going to be arriving uh, to uh, talk to Jesus and confront him. Uh, they're trying to trick him. And so if we go to the next slide, because he's around the Sea of Galilee, uh, this is a picture, a map of kind of where he's at. His headquarters is here in Capernaum. Um, he was actually in Mark 6 uh, over here on this side, but this was his home base, uh, Capernaum. And today, he we're not sure exactly where he's at today uh, at the first part of the story. I'm assuming he's in Capernaum. And then he's going to be going up to Tyre and, and then up to Sidon. Okay, so if we can have the next slide. All right. So one day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they've immersed their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So basically, in Mark 6, we ended uh, with Jesus and his disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they were in that Gennesaret. Um, and on the east, which is on the east side of Galilee, as I mentioned. Uh, but uh, as I said, they probably were in Capernaum when this happened. Uh, and so the story is actually starting with these Pharisees arriving from Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but that's about 85 miles. So uh, they don't usually get there in a day. Um, it usually would probably take them a number of days if they came on donkey or walked. Uh, I'm assuming they probably went on donkey. The Pharisees. But I don't know for sure. Um, so it took them a while to get there. Um, and so that's interesting uh, that they did that. Um, they, were, they wanted to kind of trick Jesus and kind of disprove who he was because he was claiming he was the Messiah. So who are these Pharisees? Uh, so we're going to stay on this slide for a minute. Who are the Pharisees? So I did a little research on who Pharisees are. I knew a little bit of stuff, so, but I did some background. And this is some of the things that I found out. I did some, uh, there's an awesome YouTube video uh, from Jews for Jesus about a woman named Carol Joseph. And uh, she's a, a Bible teacher who became a believer. And she was talking a little bit about the Torah and the, and the difference in the Torah and the Talmud. So the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And the Talmud is what uh, the Pharisees uh, relied on, their oral tradition. Now, the Talmud wasn't published at this time. Uh, it didn't get published until about two to 500 years after this time. It was all oral, oral traditions. Uh, and the Talmud is basically uh, conversations with uh, rabbis and Pharisees and pe people of the like who, who were, were basically interpreting scripture and the Torah. So the Talmud, uh, by many, many Jews, is considered like an author you know, authoritarian book uh, today. So the Pharisees, they were a religious sect from the middle class. Um, they weren't always necessarily the, the people who were you know, wealthy, wealthy like the Sadducees, um, but they were experts on the law, 
which is the, five, the first five books, the Torah, they believed in a strict, and this is the interesting part, a really strict adherence to important interpretations of the law, which that's what becomes the Talmud, as a path to holiness. So they thought that people could become holy by following the interpretations of God's law. Um, and they believed that holiness existed outside the temple. So it wasn't just the priests that could be holy. Every single person could be holy. And they were very respected among, uh, you know, the common ordinary people. They were the teachers. They were the educators. Sort of like, you know, I'm an educator. Uh, it's a little bit different, science and math, and, but it's, it's still the same thing. You know, they were educators. But they really believed uh, that they could... Uh, become holy by following these interpretations or these oral traditions. Um, and so I mentioned that they, oh, I also d found out that they are the origins of today's rabbis. So if you hear about rabbis today, that's the Pharisees are, you know, that all those traditions were written down and that's what the rabbis today use that information. So they were a political group also. Uh, they tried to influence the Roman government and the Roman leaders, and they would stir up the people because, you know, you can stir up people uh, who don't know what they're doing. Uh, and they wanted their agenda to happen. So they're kind of master manipulators, uh, was what I was thinking. Uh, they sought to change the way Jews should live by these holy traditions. So... Um, they, they said, oh, yeah, no, you can, you can live by these oral traditions and be holy. So they were trying to influence the ordinary people. Um, and they focused on mainly their outward image of what a true Jew is. That was their focus. Okay? And so um, Jesus, of course, sees them differently. And so the next set of verses that I'm going to start reading uh, is going to clarify that. So, uh, oh, go back one more. Thank you, because I need to get this five. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, well, why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? That's those oral laws. They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Next. Uh, but Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's laws and substitute your own tradition. Okay? Let's see how far I'm going to go. I should probably tell you that. I'm sorry. F tell 13. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own traditions. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's as all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you because uh, I vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. Too bad. So sad. Okay. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. So they were educators and they were manipulators. Okay. So clearly what Jesus is saying is you're not following the Ten Commandments. And what people didn't realize, because in the Old Testament there are 613 laws. 613. And then these guys made all these additional laws to make sure you wouldn't break those laws. And so what ended up happening in that 613 uh, Jesus was saying there's really, really only two that's the most important. The first four books of the law, the first four books, I mean, of the, uh, of the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments uh, have to do with loving me, which, what do we say the greatest commandment is? And he shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That was the first four. And then from 6 to 10 is, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? And that 
those those last ones they all had to do with you know honoring your parents um, and not murdering and you know things related to your neighbors your your people around you and so what these Pharisees were trying to do is tell people and people respected them and they were doing it not to follow God's word that's what they were saying you could disregard God's word because if you're giving the money to me or to God or to the church um, you know then then you don't have to honor your parents but that's not what God said so that's why uh, Jesus called them hypocrites. He, he was, I mean, he came right out and said it, right in front of him. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to honor uh, our fathers and our mothers. Uh, but what did the Pharisees do? They sidestepped uh, and they said, no, it's okay. You know, we don't have to give anything to our needy parents. Uh, we just need to take care of our own uh, and give the money to which is really to them, right? Um, and what's Jesus' response? You canceled the word of God. That's what he's saying. You're teaching people to cancel God's word, to disrespect my word. And that's why he was so mad. I mean, wouldn't you be mad? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next uh, part of the passage, which is, uh, I'm going to read uh, 14 through 23. Okay. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen. So here's where he's teaching. And try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd. And his disciples asked him what he meant by that parable. Because they didn't understand what that means. Like, what are you talking about? So uh, let's go all the way till 23. Don't you understand either? Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through your stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he was basically saying you can eat whatever you want. Okay? Uh, all food is acceptable in God's eyes. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. So first he was teaching the people about this and saying, hey, it's, it's not your, it's your heart that's that, e that produces that evil. It's, it's the evil thoughts that you have that causes this defilement, this purity. The Pharisees were trying to show purity by outward signs, by doing this and this and this and this and this. And he's saying that, no, it's what's in your heart. That's the problem. Okay. And later on, in, I think it's in John, where he, he talks to the Pharisees, and this might even be the same situation, where he's talking to them as they're like sepulchers, like they're like tombs in the inside. They're dead in the inside. They look pretty on the outside, but they're dead in the inside um, because, because of this. So um, food can't defile you. I thought that was interesting because a lot of the Jews, you know, they have to fall all, uh, follow all these uh, laws about you know, what foods they can eat. And from my studying and research, and I've been reading the Old Testament, uh, what I discovered, a lot of that was pr to protect the people from diseases while they were wandering the desert um, was crazy, but none of them died of diseases. Uh, there were 605,000 people died during the 40 years of wandering. And the only reason they died is because they were disobedient to God. Uh, they were the men that were counted uh, in the original census, and they didn't believe that God could take care of them. And he said that they would all die, and it was their children that lived. But none of them died of diseases because God protected them. Okay? He protected them. And so a lot of those laws that he gave them 
were, were to protect their bodies, to protect them. And it even says, in, uh, as I was reading in Deuteronomy, that they, they even their shoes didn't wear out, which is crazy. 40 years, <laughs> your sandals don't wear out. How could that be? <laughs> so, uh, so basically, for us to obtain purity, we need to have our, uh, our, our hearts cleansed. And so that has to do with our relationship with God. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. It's not what we eat that's going to cause problems. It's what, uh, it's, it's what we think. So, All right, so the next uh, part of this, and I, at first I thought I didn't see a connection, and then I thought there is a connection. Um, I was talking to my husband, Joel, and I said, you know, this doesn't make sense at first that, you know, why, why are these two miracles that we're going to see here, why are they included in this passage? Um, because I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, chapters and verses weren't part of the original Bible text. They only included, what did we say, about 1300s is when the chapters came in, and, um, and then in the 1500s is when they started putting in verses. So they didn't they didn't have, they were stories. They didn't have chapters and verses. They just thought it would be easier. Uh, and whoever did the chapters or the verses were, uh, you know, I don't, to me, they put them in the wrong places and sometimes, you know, because they're kind of in the middle, right? Uh, but so they aren't necessarily, the verses aren't necessarily, uh, I mean, God allowed it because maybe he thought it would help with people learning his word. But I don't, I don't know if, you know, he meant it to be stories. Okay, so let's go to the next part. We're going to talk about this woman, uh, the Gentile woman. And it's from Mark 7, 24 through 29. So my first thought was, here was Jesus, oops, down here. Um, and, oh, no, way up here. So he was way up here. And I thought, why would he go way up here to Tyre and Sidon? Why would he go way up there? And then I found this map, uh, which was the 12 tribes of Judah. And in the Old Testament, I had just recently read, like last week, uh, the boundary, what was supposed to be the original boundary. And they were supposed to have all the way down to here, uh, which was that Wadi uh, River um, down here. Um, and Simon, uh, Simeon and Judah, and, and Judah was supposed to have this area. But way up here was supposed to be Asher and Naphtali. And, um, and they didn't claim all their land because God said he wouldn't give it to them all at once. Uh, that uh, as long as they trusted him and continued, that, that he would give it to them. So by the t this time, uh, Tyre is right here and Sid Sidon's way up there. And that was originally uh, part of, you know, the, the, the tribe of Judah. Um, but at the time of this uh, you know, happening, it wasn't. It wasn't considered part of the tribe. So the first thing that he did is it says that he left uh, the Sea of Galilee. So if you can go to the next, uh, the next thing. So he left Galilee and he went north to the region of Tyre. And he didn't want anyone to know uh, where he was. Well, and that's just because, you know, everybody was on top of him all the time and draining his energy. And he just needed some quiet time. He needed some rest. So he didn't want people to know where he was. So he was staying in a house. Uh, but he couldn't keep it a secret. Um, and right away, a woman had heard about him, came and fell at his feet. And her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit. And she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter, since she was a Gentile born in Syrian uh, Phoenicia. So Jesus told her, first I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. So she replied, she's a very savvy person, uh, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plate. Good answer, he said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. So the interesting thing that I discovered about this story 
was in Hebrew, uh, the word dog is pronounced kelev, kelev. And some uh, people, uh, when you interpret that word, it literally means, there's, there's two pieces, kel, uh, which means all, and lev, which means heart. Well, weren't we just talking about purity? So uh, the word dog uh, literally means like the heart. Or others more modern that I saw said it means he is, meaning the dog, is a heart because he loves his master and his, you know, so dogs, you know how dogs are loyal and everything. So I thought, isn't that crazy that this woman who was Gentile knew that um, the dogs, which were at that time uh, ethnically Gentiles, were called dogs by the Jews. Um, but she was familiar with that term, dog. And typically in those days, Gentiles, uh, many of them worshipped statues or idols uh, were of dogs and they would have them on their steps um, and they had dogs as pets and uh, although dogs were considered unclean that just meant they couldn't eat them right but they could have them as pets so they did have uh, dogs as pets as referred to the story you know that the dogs were still you know they ate from the scraps so she was he was she was basically saying she was very savvy and, and sharp and at quick and thinking and saying, hey, will you provide for the dogs? Wouldn't you provide for me also? Because I have a pure heart uh, like the, the dogs, um, and I want my daughter to be healed. And so God saw that and said, it's done. So she knew that God loved her, right? And she loved her daughter. So um, I was just, just, I mean, she had wonderful faith. So that song, Great Is Your Faith Month, that was very, very cool. So um, the next story, which uh, I'm going to read next, is um, Jesus Heals a Deaf Man. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read the last part, which is 31 through the end. It says, Jesus left Tyre, and he went up to Sidon, which is that the one at the wary at the top of uh, Asher um, and going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the town, 10 towns after that. So a deaf man with a speech impediment, which I thought, why did they mention that? Because if you're deaf, especially in those days, you had a, a speech impediment. I mean, if you talk to deaf people, they, they can't hear, so they can't pronounce correctly. But it says a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. So this is really important. The people begged him. They had the heart of God for that man. They had purity of heart. So Jesus, uh, okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, thank you, Kurt, <laughs> for trying to keep up with me. Um, Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his, this is really interesting how he healed. He put his fingers into the man's ears and then spitting on its, his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Epatheth, which means be opened. And instantly the man could hear perfectly. And his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. How could he speak plainly? I mean, he, all his years of his life, I don't know how old he is, but all his years of his life, he all, he, how, could he, how could he even, his tongue hadn't ever figured out how to, how to do words right. And, and yet this is, so this is really a very powerful. Um, and so let's go to the next two. Kurt, thank you. Uh, Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, uh, th the more they spread the news because, I mean, this is like crazy stuff. Uh, they were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear, and he gives speech to those who cannot speak. 
So that verse right then is uh, related to uh, Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. So I'm going to read that to you. Uh, Isaiah says, then such healing, such, and this is the voice, uh, voice uh, version, which I really loved. Then such healing, such repair, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be clear. The lame will leap like deer excited. They will run and jump tirelessly and gracefully. The stutterer, the stammerer, and the tongue of the mute will sing out loud and clear and joyful song. So what's happening here is Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. And it's, it actually goes through 7, uh, 35, 5 through 7. And this is actually what's happening. These people loved this man so much that they had purity of heart. They went to God believing that Jesus could heal him, and he did, which is very, very powerful news. So I think the overall message um, is purity of heart, and how you get it is by believing in our Lord and Savior and asking him to cleanse us when we do have issues to forgive us and to have his spirit within us to tell us how to live and show us how to live each day so that that defilement isn't there anymore because we're living through his spirit praise the lord right praise the lord and that's god's word amen Thank you, Marge. That was great. Yeah, I love the, uh, I love that. I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. You know, I heard that story about the woman, and it's almost like Jesus kind of insulting her, but the way that you were talking about it, I don't think I've ever heard it put that way, that, you know, the, the dog's heart is so pure. And, of course, we know that if you, you know, if you have a dog, um, you know that they just they're they're always happy to see you uh and so uh so yeah so that's yeah that's really good yeah very good never thought of it that way but but yeah that was a, definitely a word in season yeah for sure amen that's great thank you, thank you.